Yes, yes, I'm Rachel Andrew, and I've actually been working on the web since about 1996, which makes me old enough to be pre-CSS. Um, and I can remember when the arguments were kind of for and against using CSS instead of font tags. And I've also been using CSS for layout really since that became a tiny bit of a possibility, right back when Netscape 4 still had a lot of market share. And uh, just after that, I was part of the Web Standards Project, and I was working with Macromedia, who had Dreamweaver at the time, and trying to get Dreamweaver to output Web Standards compliant code. And so that's really where a lot of my interest in layout comes from. And these days, uh, as mentioned, I have a CMS, and in support, I help a lot of our users who are struggling often with layout-related things, things that aren't really anything to do with our product. Because CSS layout is actually quite hard. And CSS has got loads better, hasn't it? We've got all sorts of cool stuff we can do with CSS, but we're still struggling with things that aren't really fit for purpose. And we can do layout, obviously. We're doing complex layout. But actually battling with this stuff, stuff comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of developer hours. You know, we're learning how to use these things and hack around to do layout. And they often come at a cost in us being able to order our documents in a semantic way. We have to make compromises. And they also come at a cost of us leaning on frameworks increasingly in order to kind of abstract away the complexity of doing layout. And so we have Flexbox. That's the great hope of, uh, of layout. And it's brilliant for one-dimensional layout, things that could be described in an unbroken line. But what we're seeing is an awful lot of kind of grid systems and things based on Flexbox. And unfortunately, they're a kind of hack as well, because Flexbox hasn't been designed to create grids. We need something to work with it. We need a design for purpose layout system for the kind of web applications and web pages that we're building today. We don't want to be clearing and doing hacks. We don't want to be adding extra markup in order to do layout. And this is what we have with CSS Grid Layout. And it's a specification I got really excited about when I first saw it. And I first saw it in Internet Explorer 10, because they were really the, the people who began this spec. It came from the Microsoft team. And when I saw it there, I thought, this is what we've been looking for. This is the sort of thing that I've been looking for over the many years I've been trying to do layout with CSS. And so I'm going to show you today why I love grid layout and why I think it's incredibly exciting and something that everybody should be starting to have a look at. So here's some HTML. I've got a div with a class of wrapper. It's got six child elements. I'm going to declare a grid on wrapper. And this is the first thing we need to do. We need to say that we want to use grid layout. This is a new value of the display property. We then use some more new properties. These properties created for CSS grid layout. Grid template columns creates our grid columns. And I've got three 100 pixel wide columns here with a 10 pixel gutter between them. And then grid template rows creates us some rows. So Wrapper now has a grid of three content columns with two 10 pixel gutters and two content rows. And if we could see it, it would look a bit like this. So now we've got a grid, and we can put the child elements onto that grid. So I could place the div with a class of A top left with these properties. Grid column start and grid column end let us define the lines before and after the columns. And grid row start and grid row end define the row lines above and below the item. So that puts A into the top left cell of the grid. And we can do the same with B, placing it bottom center. Now, to place B in the second content cell of the grid, I'm starting at line three because I've got a gutter line. And I'm only spanning single cells here. But that end column or grid line could be anywhere I want. So for B to span over two content columns, which is actually two content columns and a gutter track, we just sent change grid column end to six. Now, that's quite verbose, all of those properties. So there's obviously a shorthand. So these are the rules for our two positioned items. And we can compress grid column start and grid column end into grid column. And basically the same with grid row. 
And if you know, we've got a forward slash there separating the two properties, the first value being start, the second value being end. We can go a step further and actually do all that in one line. So this is using the grid area property. Now, the order of those lines is grid row start, grid column start, grid row end, grid column end. And that's essentially the opposite direction to how we declare mar margins and padding. I know not why. Um, personally, I think that's actually quite confusing, that very short shorthand. Um, and I prefer the previous one, declaring um, two at a time. Uh, it's worth noting that those grid lines are indexed, they're relating to writing mode. So if you were in a right to left language, the first column line would be the right hand line. So that's the real basics of positioning items with grid. Uh, there's a little bit of new terminology in this spec, as we found with Flexbox as well. So I'm just going to explain that because it will help with our examples going forward. So we've got grid lines. We've seen those already numbered grid lines. And they can be horizontal or vertical. They can also be named. And we have grid tracks. And that's any row or column between two row or column lines. Then we have cells. Now, they're conceptually just like a table cell. It's the smallest unit on our grid between four lines. And then we have grid areas. And that's any area on the grid bound by four grid lines. So that can include many grid cells. And that area is defined just by setting start and end lines. So these are the key things to remember. Because we're going to have a look at some worked examples. Now, all of these are online. All of these you can have a look at, you can play with if you use Chrome or Opera um, with the experimental web platform features flag enabled. So you can go and have a look. And I'll be giving a direct link to each of these as I go through. And my slides I'll be publishing at the end. So you can go and have a look at them. So we've just looked at the beginning of this presentation at line-based placement. So let's have a look at a more realistic example of an actual page. I'm going to build something like this using grid. So it's a very, very straightforward layout. And this is where that example will be. So here's my HTML. I've got a parent with a class of wrapper, and there's three child elements there. We've got a header and a sort of panel and a content area. And I've added a bit of CSS. That's using the skeleton framework just for the typography, but it's got no layout. So it's just displaying, as you'd imagine, in source order. So we get started by setting up our grid as before. And I've got three columns here, and the 5% column there is acting as a gutter between the sidebar and the main content. And we've got four rows. And I've got some of those set to height auto, so they'll expand to whatever I put in them, which tends to be what you want. Now I've declared a grid, but I haven't positioned anything. So it all looks a bit funny. It's less odd if you consider that what grid's doing is trying to position the items based on its um, auto-placement algorithm. But it doesn't know that that skinny column is a gutter between two columns. So it's trying to jam some content in there. We'll have a look at why it's doing that later. But now we just want to position our items. So we position the header, the class of main header, right across the grid from column line one to column line four. And it's starting at row line two and finishing at three. And then we're also positioning the panel there and the main content. So we end it with our layout like this. Now, the panel here has a gray background, which is a bit hard to see on the screen maybe, but that's taken full height. And that's because both the panel and the main content know about each other. Um, so the background of the panel is going to extend right down to the bottom of the row. They're both actually in the same row. And it's this ability for one item to be able to react to another that we've kind of been missing in all of our layout methods until Flexbox and Grid. Things didn't have any relationship. So if we overlay the grid, you can see how the elements are now in a row, and they're in their own column. So if I wanted to put a footer on this layout, I could add that into the markup and then position it right across the layout from column line one to line four and put it between row lines five and six. And it would just sit down there. There's no clearing required because it's in its own row. It can't jump up and overlap anything because it's in its own row. Now, if you'd been observant, you might have realized that that row between lines five and six, that doesn't actually exist in the grid that I defined at the beginning. 
because grid will actually create grid lines. If you position something outside of what we call the explicit grid, the grid you've defined, grid will just create extra lines to create the tracks to put that content in. Um, they'll just stretch to fit the content unless you specify a size with grid auto columns and grid auto rows. So you can continue to add items, probably at the bottom of your grid rather than out to the sides generally. Um, and grid will just cope with that. It will just add extra lines for you. Now, if you've been looking at this and you're as old as me, you might be thinking, well, this looks a bit like tables for layout. And conceptually, if you've come from the past, it, it feels a bit like that. And that's kind of how I think about, about grid. Um, but unlike tables, it obviously doesn't rely on your content being in a particular source order. The problem with tables for layout is you end up with your content kind of fragmented around the table. It became very difficult to actually create any sensible structure out of it. But also, this grid is in, entirely described in CSS. There's nothing in your markup to describe the grid, which means you can introduce a grid at different breakpoints. You can redefine the grid whenever you want to in your CSS and depending on your media queries. This is actually really powerful. But with great power comes responsibility because it would be very, very easy to stop caring about source order with things like grid and, and with Flexbox and just move things around on the grid and stop worrying about creating that logical tab order through your document. So with all of this new stuff, it's really important to think, let's use it to enhance the accessibility, start with something accessible and enhance it, rather than not worrying about source order because we can just move things around now. So an example of moving things around based on media queries, is using the same HTML as you had before, I'm going to make that layout responsive and I'm gonna start mobile first. So here I'm just using the grid to rearrange some of the elements for best viewing on mobile. So I end up with something like this for my narrow layouts. And then I can go back and in my media queries, I redefine the grid and I'm also positioning the elements. So then we're going back to that two column layout that we had before. And I've now added an explicit row and a gutter for that footer. So grid makes it really easy just to move things around based on media queries. You can create yourself a good document outline, make sure that's accessible, make sure you've got a good tab order, and then you can move things around so that you get the best display on your different devices. So we've looked at positioning things using line numbers. You can also name your lines, and that might make it a bit easier than having to work out which number line you are on the grid. So if we go back to this same layout, and the example I'm gonna show you is at that URL. So here, when defining my single column layout, I'm actually naming the row lines. So we've got things in square brackets here, which is the name for the line, and then we have the, the value. So when we position items, it's exactly the same, except we use the name of the line rather than its numerical position. So instead of this, we end up with this, which is a bit more verbose, but it can be really useful if you're, say, using a responsive design, you can always be targeting the same names line rather than knowing that, well, at narrow screen widths, it's this number line, and at wide screen widths, it's another number line. So naming the lines can be a lot easier, and also easier if you're working with a team of people. They don't all have to be working out sort of what you're doing with a complex grid. But there's more. This is a huge spec. We can also name areas. So we can name areas using the grid template areas property. So again, we'll stick with the same markup, the same layout, and this is here in my examples. So the first thing we do is, outside of any media queries, in the CSS, we assign a name to the elements on the page. That can be anything you like. It's just something that identifies that element. And we're using the grid area property, which we first saw as the very short shorthand uh, when we were defining the, the line-based areas. So here's where I set up my grid for the mobile width layout. That's the single column layout. So I've set up my grid, and instead of positioning each item with its own rules, I'm creating the layout using those names as the value of the grid template area property. And this sometimes gets referred to as a kind of ASCII art method of positioning, because you're sort of describing your layout. And that's it, that's the layout. 
So we have a narrow layout like this. And there it is with those named template areas overlaid. And we can see the ASCII art a bit clearer when we go into our media queries. So there's the wider layout and within the media queries, and I'm describing the layout. And you can see how that value actually starts to look like the layout. So there's the layout there. And that's with the named areas overlaid. Now, for straightforward layouts, that's a really nice way to work. And in fact, although this isn't in any browser out from behind a flag yet, I've been using this to prototype UI designs because it's really easy to move things around. So if I'm working on a responsive layout, and I'm thinking, well, where should this fall? You know, should this be further up or lower down? I'm using this to move things around quickly and actually prototype. And I've been doing that for about a year. Uh, it's a very, very nice way to work because you can just set things up, you can move them around, and you can just see how things are going to work. You can actually use um, one or multiple full stop characters to indicate an empty cell. So if you want to neatly line up your ASCII art, you can do that. So those full stops there show where there is, obviously, gutter tracks, you can see them, and then you might have them between um, the sidebar and the content. That's also a gutter track. So you can use one or many full stop characters. So something else that happens when we use these named areas is we get implicit named grid lines, which we can also use to position in the normal way with the line-based positioning. So that's our layout. And we've got a named grid area called content. And so grid creates for us content start and content end for the rows and columns. So I can position an area test to start on the line before the area defined as content with content start and end after that area with content end. I'm then starting it at the implicit row line content start before content and finishing after the footer, because the line after the footer is footer end. And you end up with something like this, which isn't really anything you'd want, but it kind of demonstrates a purpose. Um, and it also shows that you can layer items on the grid. I gave that test area a higher Z index to the other items on the grid, so it sat on top. So that's another thing you can do with grid layout, is you can layer items, which again is something you couldn't really do with tables. And they just use the, the Z index property. So those are some very simple examples of using grid to position very simple layouts, and they're great. But I think that when people think of grid, grid layout today, they're thinking of grid systems, thinking of the 12 and 16 column flexible grids that we have. Uh, things like frameworks such as Bootstrap have a grid system inbuilt. And I think they're the kind of grids that people want to be developing. They want to be able to use these complex grids and then move things around on them. So this is um, some example code from the Bootstrap framework. Now, these grids do help us all avoid all of the complex maths in creating responsive grid-based layouts, because it isn't easy. As we've seen, our sort of layout techniques are difficult to use at the moment. The problem is these frameworks are conceptually very heavy. We're having to actually describe our grid in our markup here. And so even if you're not worried about presentational classes or things being semantic, even if you're not worried about that, it's an awful lot of code to be sticking into our markup. And it does tie our markup to our CSS. And also, to add new breakpoints, we're having to add more markup. And there's kind of a limit to how much of that you can do um, without it all going a bit crazy. So it's not an ideal way to do things. And with CSS grid layout, what we're doing is we're describing the layout in our CSS. And so we can add as many breakpoints as we want to. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't really matter because it, it's all there in the CSS. It's not in the markup. We're not having to change the markup to use it. And it gives us the ability to kind of flexibly redefine those grids. So I think the first thing to remember when we're looking at CSS grid layout as a replacement to things like Bootstrap or these other grid systems, you know, we're looking at something very different conceptually. It's a very different thing, a different way of thinking about doing grid layout. So the typography in my examples comes from the skeleton framework, which has a similar kind of grid to Bootstrap. It's a bit sort of a lighter framework, which is why I quite like it. Uh, but again, you have to add rows and classes to your markup to achieve the grid. So I was having a look at this, and in one of my experiments, I thought, well, can I reproduce things from the skeleton framework? Can I reproduce that with grid layout? 
And before I show you that example, I'm going to introduce a couple of new concepts. So once we start creating a multi-column grid, our grid definitions start to look very verbose because we've got an awful lot of tracks to define. So when you're creating a definition, you can use a repeat keyword. So you use the keyword repeat, then the number of times you want to repeat a pattern, and then you create a pattern. So we've got a statement here, together as a line, then a 200 pixel track, then a line, and a 20 pixel gutter track, repeated four times. Something else we're going to see is this fraction unit, the FR unit. It's a fraction of the available space in the grid container, which means you can easily say, I want this track to be twice as wide as this other track. Uh, you can specify the proportion of gutter tracks to content tracks. It's a very nice way to specify flexible layouts, but you don't have to worry about calculating percentages to use it, which is good. And we also looked at named grid lines earlier. Now, of course, once we start repeating a pattern, we're going to have multiple lines named the same thing. And we can then use a span keyword to span multiple lines based on their name. So here, I'm naming the line before a content track call and the line before a gutter track gutter. So when I position my content, I can start it on the second line named call, call two, then span two lines named gutter. Now, that is a little bit confusing until you start doing it. It becomes a lot easier once you just start playing around. And with all of these examples, I really would say go and have a look at my examples and play with them in practice because it becomes an awful lot clearer once you start to just adjust things and see how it behaves. So here's a markup for the skeleton framework. So it's required some classes. It's required some extra divs for rows. We're having to describe the layout that we want a bit in the markup. You know, we're having to say we want four columns and eight columns. And we get a grid that looks a bit like this. So that's just using the default skeleton grid. So for my grid layout version, I can remove the row divs. I don't need those. And I can also remove the classes because we're not going to describe our grid in markup anymore. Now, here I'm using the classes box one, box two, but in reality, they could be semantic class names. That could be, you know, content or sidebar, whatever you wanted. There could even be HTML5 elements. So we've now removed any description of how our grid works from the markup. I then create my grid using this slightly more complex definition because I'm using the repeat keyword. I've named the lines, so we're going to have multiple row and column lines and multiple gutters for rows and columns. Uh, and outside of the repeat, I'm just tidying up the columns so I don't end up with a trailing gutter. And we can then place our items onto the grid. And I'm using the named line syntax here. I want box one to start in the first line named col and then span to the fourth line named gutter. The box is in the first row, so it starts at the first row line and ends at the first gutter line. And I can do the same with box eight. So I'm starting on column line seven. I'm spanning three gutter lines. Now, because we're using these named lines, we don't need to worry which line of the grid the third gutter line after column line seven is. We just need to know we want three columns. So this is a complete grid layout version, sort of mimicking the skeleton version. So we can easily replace that kind of layout system using grid layout. But grid actually lets us go a step further than this. And it lets us do something which is pretty hard to do currently with our existing frameworks. And that's to control the height of things, to control the actual grid rows and how many rows something spans. Because we can span rows in exactly the same way that we span columns. So here I'm setting up a couple of my boxes to span two and three gutters. So in that third example, I'm not just putting things into single rows, I'm spanning rows. And as you can see, the heights go to the gutter no matter how much content is in the block. And that behavior is the same really as Flexbox. And all of that you can find at that URL. So playing around with, with grid examples, that's great. But let's look at a more realistic example, because we can rebuild that uh, two-column layout I had in the earlier examples using the content areas set out on our skeleton-inspired grid. 
So the header and footer start at the first line named col and span to gutter line 12. The header starts after the first row line and the footer the third. Between them sit the panel and the content. After row line two, the panel is a sidebar, spans four gutters, and the content takes the rest of the width. And then we get that same layout again, which is at that URL. So again, that makes it really easy for us just to play around with the layout. We might decide that instead of a full width footer, we want the panel to extend to the bottom of the content and the footer to kind of sit up there under the content. Now, I only need to change the values in the CSS to do that. So this is the CSS. And I change some values to move my footer. And then it just sits there. So it's really easy to move things around. We're not having to worry about what's cleared and what isn't cleared. Um, and we can just move them around. It wouldn't matter if we had a very complex layout if certain things needed to be moved in the source to do that. Um, as long as we're keeping the the accessibility of the document and the tab order sensible for anyone who's needed to tab around it, we're kind of freed from that sort of design being tied to the source order and having to make decisions. And usually the decision is that you compromise your source orders to get the layout, and that happens quite a lot. We shouldn't have to do that when we're using grid. And there's more. So very early on in this presentation, I showed an example of where we had some text jammed into a gutter column. And I explained that Grid was trying to auto-place that content, and so it didn't know that was a gutter column, so it stuck the content in there. So most of the time, when you're building a layout, you want to position things on the layout. You want to say, well, this is my header, and it's going to go up here, and, and this sidebar is going to become a sidebar. But sometimes it's nice to be able to create a grid and have a chunk of content and chuck it at the grid and it just lay out all nicely. So I'm going to show you an example of where that might be useful and how that works with the grid item placement algorithms. It's also useful to know about the item placement algorithm because it's going to help you understand what grid is doing if it encounters some content that you haven't positioned. Uh, it'll save you some sort of baffling situations where things appear in very odd places. So we have our skinny column here. And this, if you didn't know how the item placement algorithm works, you know, so well, why has that appeared there? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So in this example, I've got an unordered list. It's got a class of wrapper. The first list item contains some text, and the rest is an image. So I've given a class of wide to a couple of those list items. So obviously, if we've got no layout, we get something like this. We've got the text at the top, and then we've got our images. Now, that might work very nicely for someone who didn't have grid or on a phone or whatever. That's fine. But I'm going to try and create a responsive layout, making the text the priority. So at the most narrow breakpoint, I want that text first, so that people can read the text and then see the images if they want to. At a slightly wider breakpoint, I would still want that text to come first, but I'm going to have the images spanning two columns. And for desktop view, I'm going to position the text centrally and have the images flow around it. But I don't know how many images I've got. I don't know how many are in that list. Maybe it's coming out of some CMS. So I can't position each of those separately. So here's how we might do that. Before any media queries are applied, I create a grid on wrapper, and that's the UL element. I set the grid to have one column taking up all available space, and I set the rows to auto. I'm then adding a new property, something we haven't seen yet, and that's grid auto flow. I'm setting the value to dense. That won't change much at the moment. We'll see what that does later. So we've now got a grid, and each list item has its own grid row. Grid is automatically creating those rows for us. It's not going to make a huge difference. We've got our text first and the images following for narrow screens. So I now go to a two-column grid. The only item here I'm actually giving a position is the list item containing the text. It's got a class of text, and so it's set to span from line one to line three. Now, I've also got those list items containing images that I added a class of wide to. 
Now, they're not positioned as such. Um, they're start position set to auto. But I've given them a column end of span two, because I want them to span two lines, which essentially makes them the same width as the item with a class of text. So grid's going to go on. It's going to place the images, and it's going to place them in, into the two columns. And then it's going to come across one with a class of wide. It knows that has to span the two columns. And so it does so, and then it carries on. So we end up with this. Now, because we set autoflow to dense, that large item is actually the fourth item in the source. But it has to drop down onto the next row rather than display next to balloons three because it's too wide. We can't have something that spans that many columns in, in that area, which means that the image balloons five actually backfills into the gap left. It's taking itself out of source order, out of the order in the DOM which for a bunch of images, that might be absolutely fine. It doesn't matter which order they visually display in. So then when I go to my wide breakpoint, I redefine the grid and have four equal width columns. I'm then positioning that text block so it will be top center of the grid, spanning two grid tracks and two row tracks. And so that's the wide breakpoint display. <coughs> You can see the text area has been positioned, and the image is just placed around it by grid. Once again, the image balloons 5 has been taken out of DOM order due to the dense packing mode. And you can see and play around with that example of that URL. That's the entire CSS for the layout. So we're really not positioning very much stuff at all. We're just letting grid figure out what to do with it based on a few rules. If we change that grid auto flow to sparse, right up there in, in the definition there on, on wrapper, what happens is that image balloon 5 now renders below balloon 4, and we get a gap. So things stay in DOM order, rather than grid saying, oh, I've got a little space here. I'll pop something into it. Uh, so by default, grid will move forward. Sparse is the default. So by default, grid will not take things out of DOM order. If you set it to dense, then it will do. But that's kind of a decision you need to make. You need to decide that this is absolutely fine if these things don't display in order. There's obviously an awful lot of things. If you allowed grid to lay it out and said you want to set it to dense, you would just end up with complete nonsense because grid would be reordering things for you. So this is pretty cool. You can use grid to position elements even if you don't know how many of the things you will have and even if you don't know everything about them. And you can just set up some rules. It's great for dynamic content. Um, so for example, if you had a bunch of images, some were landscape and some were portrait, and you wanted to display those differently, you could just set up rules for that and grid would just display them. Really great sort of galleries of images and those kind of layouts. So those are some quick examples. As I mentioned, you need to play with these things. Um, they make very little sense until you actually get your hands on it and start playing with it. But I'm a huge fan of this specification, as you might have realized. It's a really elegant solution, I think. And I've been following it over the last couple of years. And I really think it solves an awful lot of our problems. And the reason that I've been going around conferences and talking about this and writing about it is because I really believe that we, the people who build things for the web, need to make sure our voices are heard by those who create specifications for the web and the people who are implementing this stuff in browsers. And we need to do that at a point at which things can change, not when the spec is finished. Because when the spec is finished, then you're going to have to wait till the next level of that spec is created before the things you want changed might be considered. So in previous versions of this presentation, I had a chunk where I talked about my belief that grid needs proper gutter tracks. So here's that example again. Grid doesn't know that's a gutter, so it's sticking some content into it. In our 12-column grid, I was specifying column lines and gutter lines. In the autoflow example, I just avoid the problem altogether and use margins and padding to create space between the elements. Now, I've been talking about this for well over a year, and I was posting to the working group mailing list and explaining, I think we need gutters. I think we need something like we have in multi-column layout. And after some discussion, the proposal to add something like um, the column gap was pushed into level two of this spec. 
which I wasn't happy about, so I kept on going on about it. And eventually I got the ear of one of the spec authors when I was at CSS Day doing this presentation. And Fantasy has now written grid row gap and grid column gap into level one of the specification. So we, instead of having something like this to specify the gutters as grid tracks, we'll be able to do this with grid column gap and grid row gap. Now that's not implemented in the browsers yet, so I can't sort of show you a live example. Um, the column lane names were only, and uh, gutter names were only decided at the working group uh, last month. But that's something we should get, and it's gonna make simple grids much easier to manage. Now I wasn't the only person pushing for this. You know, various people said, we need this. This is something that authors are gonna want. But it demonstrates that by regular people who write CSS going on about something and saying, you know, we need this, things can change, because we're at a point where things can change. But it's not only spec writers that we have to convince about things we believe are important. If you go to the CSS Working Group or you look and see who goes to CSS Working Group meetings, you'll find that most of the people sat there are representatives of browser vendors. They're not web developers. We get referred to as authors by the CSS Working Group, you know, people who actually author HTML and CSS. So if browser vendors don't implement the things that are in the spec, then they might as well not be in the spec because we can't use them if they're not implemented. So I've got a case here of something that is in the spec that I really want implemented, so I'm trying to rally the troops as I wander the globe talking about grid. So in exactly the same way as Flexbox, only direct children of the element with grid become grid items. And just like in Flexbox, something which is a child of a flex item, something that's a child of the grid, can also have a grid uh, applied to it. So if I have something like this, so I've got a set of divs here and I've got some nested inside another. Box D is a grid item itself, but it can also have a grid declared upon it. But grid only controls the direct children, so nothing is inherited by this new grid. But it would let us do something like this. So obviously it's useful to be able to nest grids one inside another. But if you're working with a complex grid, it would be really cool if nested items could actually use the grid declared on the parent. So you can say, well, I've got this grid, and anything in this layout should sit on that grid. And the level one spec also includes a subgrid keyword. So a grid declared as a subgrid would use the grid specified on the parent, which would allow that scenario. Instead of setting up columns and rows on D, we'd use the subgrid keyword. And you can use that parent grid for rows or columns or both. And now if we position child items, they'd be positioned according to the parent grid lines. Unfortunately, this is completely unimplemented in browsers, and it doesn't look like anyone's really thinking about implementing it, which is a problem, because if it isn't implemented, then it will probably get removed from the level one spec and it will get bumped into level two. Now, as well as I think subgrid being nice to be able to line things up to a parent grid, I think there are accessibility implications of losing it. Because if everything has to be a child of the element that's got grid declared, the temptation will be to flatten out markup so that everything can become a child of the grid and everything will be easy to position. Now, authors might not do that. We might not do that because we try and be responsible. But I think grid is going to be brilliant for being able to create layouts using some kind of tool. Um, you know, going back to the work I did with Dreamweaver, you know, actually being able to just move things around on a grid is kind of like dynamite for visual layout tools. But the temptation of those tools, I think, will be to flatten out markup to make creating grids easy if we don't have subgrid. Uh, Fansai has said why she thinks that we need subgrid. I've also written up my thoughts on the subject, and you know, do have a look at that. I would like to see more people saying, hey, can we get subgrid implemented? Because if it gets implemented in browsers, then it'll stay. Um, but if no one implements it, then it's quite likely it's gonna get removed, and I don't know when you know, when we'll actually get it, you know, once grid is finished. Um, and grid is very close to being finished, and it's a really good time to start getting your hands on it and seeing if you can spot any real problems. You know, I'd love people who are more designers to be looking at this stuff um, and, and seeing how they might be using it. So do have a look at my examples, and 
see what you think about GRID. GRID is coming. Um, interestingly, it's been developed. The implementation that is in Blink and WebKit is being sponsored by Bloomberg. It's been done by an open source consultancy, Agalia. It's very, very good, and you can get your hands on it. You can play with it. Just enable the experiment web platform features flag. Um, Edge have now got it as high priority to update the IE 10 and 11 implementation to match the new spec. Mozilla are implementing. Um, there's also a polyfill in, in development. When Grid lands, it's kind of going to land pretty hard because it's there and it's sort of waiting um, until the spec's kind of finished. Uh, so we shouldn't end up with a situation we've had with Flexbox where we end up with kind of like various versions and it all being a bit vague. I think when Grid lands, it's going to land fairly completely and we're going to be able to start using it, those of us who are fortunate enough to have a lot of modern browsers and particularly on mobile, <coughs> we'll be able to start using it fairly soon. Do have a look at those examples. Everything I've posted is there and a lot more beside. Um, I'll be around all day, so come and talk to me about Grid. Um, I really like talking about this stuff. And I've got more resources on this URL. Thank you very much. <laughs>